uh, and the different people sharing the meetings. Uh, just pick up a copy on your way out today. <coughs> a couple of weeks ago, I started on a very <coughs> touchy subject, and the subject I was dealing with was the uh, giving. Giving as dealing with monetary issues. And it is an issue today for Christians because it's, I don't believe it's completely known exactly what the scriptures has to tell us about this subject. The most exclusive passage on this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. So if you want to turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, we'll continue on where we uh, left off last week. <clears throat> While you're turning there, I've come up with an outline that I feel would uh, add a little bit of light to understanding these two chapters. First of all, <clears throat> in chapter 8, verses 1 to 7, we have Paul's record of the grace of Macedonia, where he uses the Macedonian Christians as an example of God's grace being utilized within the Christian community. Secondly, in verses 8 to 15, we have Paul's recollection of the grace of God. And this is the portion that I will be dealing with today, as far as we can get. And then from chapter 8, verse 16 to 9, verse 7, we have Paul's recommendation of the bearers of grace. And then in chapter 9, verses 8 to the end of the chapter, verse 15, we have Paul's reassurance of the suppliers of grace, or the supplier of grace, which is the Lord. Last week, we looked at the first seven verses hurriedly, and uh, just for a bit of background, um, in verse 1, we have a consideration to giving, as Paul mentions the Macedonian Christians, and in this verse, he says that the grace that they have and the grace that they use in giving for the poor saints in Jerusalem was a grace that was given by God, because the word bestowed, as we looked last week, is a perfect passive participle, intimating that it's not sporadic, but it's continual giving and it's supplied by God. In no way do we ever take upon ourselves, in a sense, to give. God works through us and we have to allow it. He is our only enablement in our Christian walk to do anything because he says, without me, you can do nothing. Secondly, we looked at the conditions of giving. And in verse 2, we find that the people in Macedonia were very poor. In verse 2, there's two subjects. Abundance and poverty. The abundance was not money. The abundance was joy. And at the same time, the poverty was according to depth. That word bathos is used as in the depth of the ocean. These people were below Skid Road. They were in poverty-stricken state because of Roman invasions as well as civil wars. And the land had been ransacked during that times. And they were under persecution because they were Christians. Yet... We came up with the formula, abundance, which is joy, plus deep poverty. And yet in verse 2 he says that's equal to riches. Tell that to the world and they'll laugh at you. But in front of our Lord, this is where you become rich. Their attitude and their uh, place of giving, their circumstances, in the circumstances that are recorded, deep poverty, you'd never think they would give. Yet... He says in verse 3, they gave beyond their ability because they knew there was a greater need in Jerusalem. A very unselfish motive. Then we looked at verses 3 to 5, which are the conditions for giving. <clears throat> and he states that it's, for, uh, it's, it's according to the ability of the individual. Rich or poor makes no difference. God says it's according to your ability. In verse 4, which I skipped over last week uh, by mistake, what they're basically saying in verse 4 is they, they allowed the disciples who were carrying this offering to the Jerusalem saints to take a part in it. That verse uh, in the King James Version, there's take upon us in italics, which is the um, translators, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think it's right. This is what they put in. It should be beseeching us which mu with much entreaty the gift and the fellowship of the ministry which was for the saints. In other words... Yes, Paul, you and the bearers of this gift can also have a part in it because it cost them also to go on these journeys. They were in full-time ministry for the Lord. Then he summed it up in verse 7. He says, Therefore, as you abound in everything, 
And in 1 Corinthians, which he wrote a year prior to this, he said, you people lack in nothing in the sense of spiritual gifts. But he says, if you lack in this grace, then you are incomplete. Paul was looking for a Christian to be complete. And this was the instruction that God gave him to show them. Now in the second portion, we have Paul's, let's see if I get this right, Paul's recollection of the grace of God. First of all, you'll notice he used an example of Christians, fellow Christians on a human level. And these Christians were poor. Now he's going to use an example on the opposite extreme of a man who was totally rich beyond all comparison, a man who was God himself, and that's Jesus Christ. And we'll look at this in verses 8 to 15. In verses 8 and 9, I believe Paul is giving an admonition. And then in verses 10 to 15, Paul is giving advice. Let's look at verse 8. I speak not by commandment, and I believe this is very significant because people who would be listening to this right away would be thinking, aha, this guy's becoming legalistic. Remember, we're only 25 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This letter was ri written roughly 57 AD. And people right off the bat would probably be taking offense. And there were Jewish people present at that time, as we're going to find out that in verse 15, he uses, a, uses an illustration from the Old Testament for his Jewish listeners. But he says, I speak not by commandment. We're not under law, but we're under grace. Paul, who wrote the issues of grace as expressed in the book of Romans, the righteousness of God apart from the law. Paul, who wrote about the heresy in the Galatian churches, about being legalistic. Salvation is not by doing good works. And salvation, he says, is not by being circumcised. Salvation to the Galatian Christians he mentioned was by faith and faith alone. And if you ever want to understand the righteousness of God and the faith, then you better take a look at the book of Romans because it's quite an exposition on God's righteousness. I speak not by commandment, and now he gives two reasons why he does speak, but by the occasion of the earnestness of others. At this point, he's pointing back to the Macedonian Christians. Remember, Paul is in Macedonia, and he's, well, which is north of Achaia, which Corinth, the Isthmus of Corinth is about, I don't know how many miles below it, but he is writing this letter, and he had it sent ahead of himself to prepare these Christians for his arrival, probably his third visit, and probably Titus was the bearer of the letter. He's, and here's Paul up in Macedonia, who had used the Corinthians as an example of Christians that were willing to give. And when he told this to the Macedonian Christians, they were just overwhelmed, as we saw in verse 2 and verse 3. They gave beyond their ability in deep poverty to help these saints that were far across the Mediterranean. They've never met them in Jerusalem. The earnestness of the Macedonians, Macedonians sparked Paul. He says, I have to tell you about this. I'm not speaking by commandment, but when I see these people, their earnestness, I have to tell you this. They're getting rich. And their riches are not in money. Their riches are in spiritual blessings. Abounded, verse 2, unto the riches of their liberality. The word liberality mean, meaning single-mindedness, unaltered, unprejudiced giving, spontaneous giving, because they knew that somebody else was in need. And not only that, but Paul states, and to prove the sincerity of your love. If you've ever looked at the book of James you would find out that James does a very good uh, exposition on works and faith. Let me just turn there for a minute. In James chapter 2, he says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? Paul, I believe, struck in this today when he said, If you don't do something for an individual, if you don't feed him and clothe him and get him in a comfortable state, what's the use of witnessing to them? Here we have an occasion in the book of James where he says, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be you warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? You know, they come to you and you say, Well, my blessings be upon you. They're still naked and they're still hungry. You haven't helped them a bit. What an illustration. You say you have faith, but you don't have works. 
The Bible says the saving faith is a faith that's manifest in a life of works. And three times he says faith without works is dead. In other words, your faith is shown to other people by your works. Back to Corinthians. The same principle is here. He says, prove the sincerity of your love. Well, love without action, how can it be proved? You can say, well, I love you, but unless you express it in a life, then there's no use to it. He says, if you say you're sincere in love, and at this point, in the context, he's dealing with giving to the saints in Jerusalem, you say you love your brothers and sisters in Christ, yet you don't give to them because... At this point, a year down the line, Paul said, as we're going to look later on, probably another Sunday from now, he said, you people were willing. Why aren't you doing it? You have to prove your love, just like your faith is proven to individuals by your work. You'll know a, Christ a Christian by their walk. A good tree does not continually bring forth bad fruit. In other words, Paul reminds them, show your love to the Jerusalem saints. They're in poverty. And this is the reason why I wrote and secondly, in verse 9, he uses the most exclusive example he could ever use of a man that gave, and that's Jesus Christ. Verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. At this point, if Paul would have used the word oida, which means to know, it would mean you fully know. But he could not use that word. He uses the word genosko. Genosko means knowing but knowing in a sense of progress in knowledge. Like when we say we know Jesus Christ, we only know him as we excel in our understanding of his written revelation to know his person. He says the same thing with Jesus Christ. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You only understood, first of all, by inception of the Holy Spirit, by becoming believers, born again, and then understanding by the writings and probably 20 year, 25 years down the line, probably some would have been in Jerusalem to even have witnessed the crucifixion and resurrection. But he says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, we have to stop here and say, when was Jesus Christ rich? When was he rich? Let's see. He wasn't born in the Jerusalem General Hospital, was he? They had no room for a pregnant woman anywhere in the city. He was born in a barn, in a stable, along with the calves and whatever was in there. During his life, which we don't have a great record of in the Bible, was he rich? There was no mention of him ever being rich. In fact, he was a poor carpenter's son, and he practiced the trade himself. When he went to the cross, was he rich? No, he wasn't rich. In fact, they stripped him of everything he ever had. They took his clothes. I don't think we really recognize just by mere words what our Lord really went through. We can only surmise by what we compare to sufferings about the grace that he gave to us in himself. But I don't think we'll ever recognize the agony of the father giving his only son, turning his back on him. The God of all eternity, when was he rich if his whole life was spent in poverty? He was rich because he was God, and that richness was in eternity past, as well as in eternity future. But at this point, it says, for your sakes he became poor. If you establish the fact that Christ could only have been rich prior to his incarnation or his condescension from the place of the heavenlies to a place of humiliation in the form of a servant, and is that not what it says in, uh, what it says in Philippians 2? Let this mind or attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, now that word being means continually existing in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God. He knew him and his father were one, but took upon himself the form of a servant. Can you imagine? He was made in the likeness of men. There's a difference if you're to study theology as to Christ's humanity and our humanity because he was without sin, yet he was identified in the flesh to become the perfect sacrifice for us. Faith without works, it doesn't show. Love, unless it's not expressed in action, it just doesn't, it's not feasible, it just doesn't make sense. Here is the most exclusive account of God giving 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Notice, we read that verse all the time, but it says he gave, he gave his only begotten Son. Romans 5 says, but God commendeth his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The sacrifice of giving. How did God love us? He loved us by giving us a chance. And the only chance we could ever have was to believe that Christ was the only perfect sacrifice that would ever, ever satisfy him to have taken away our sins. For your sakes he became poor. Now there's an expression of love. God did not just sit there and say, well, you know, maybe to Jesus Christ, we should, you know, you should be this sacrifice. And Christ never just willingly said, well, I think I will, but I don't know if I want to go through with it. Can you imagine where we would be today if Jesus Christ decided, well, I'm changing my mind, which obviously is a sheer impossibility, but can you imagine? Well, I know I said I love them, but I really don't want to go through with this. It's, it's sacrifice. You can imagine where we'd be today. No hope. We wouldn't be sitting here, that's for sure. Because we'd be out there having a good old time before we went to the pit for eternity. But Christ and his Father went through with it. They completed their act of love. And Christ gave himself totally for every one of us. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor for the reason that you through his poverty might be made rich. Again, the unselfishness of such a great act from our Lord. And when Paul uses his example, he goes on in verses 10 to 15 to give his advice. He says, and in this I give my advice. What does he mean by in this? What did he just say? His advice stems from the sacrifice of giving and the one who proved it the most. And that was God himself giving his son in the previous example in the Lord Jesus Christ. I give my advice because of the sacrifice of God. He says it is expedient for you. Again, he is concerned for the Corinthian believers who have begun before not only to do but also to be willing a year ago. He knew their willingness. He knew the willingness that they had when he was there. Oh, we'll support the saints in Jerusalem, them poor people. And I mean, they were ransacked. There was nothing... They were in a, in a worse state than the Macedonian Christians. This, let me read you again just a quick account on Hebrews 10. In Hebrews 10 he says, But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great flight of, uh, a fight of afflictions, partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were used. For you had compassion on me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Speaking of the Jewish people, when they trusted Jesus Christ, and it is no different today, they were literally, literally just thrown out. We, have, we will have nothing to do with you. They were ransacked. They were made a gazing stock. They were in total poverty. And yet, they knew in heaven there was a more eternal, eternal promise, a more eternal substance than the things that they had lost. But listen, in our world, unfortunately, we cannot survive, in a sense, without money because money buys food, etc., clothes. It's just sad today that there just seems to be such a misconception of Christian giving and, and today places where people are trying to tithe people. That's not what the New Testament tells us to do. As Paul says in verse 8, I speak not by commandment. The law has been done away with. But listen, Christian, we have responsibility, and that responsibility is to one another. He gave his advice in verse 10, you were willing. Now verse 11, therefore, perform the doing of it. Remember, God acted out his love in his son. Faith is acted out in its manifestation of works. He says, well, you're giving to these Jerusalem saints can only be true giving if it's really enacted. It has to be acted out by you. Perform, epitaleo. Taleo means to complete. In other words, completely perform the doing of it. That is, there was, 
that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance. And again, the word is epithaleo, a complete performance also out of that which you have. There's no room for dreaming. If I had a million dollars and one of 649, what I could do for you, Lord. Meanwhile, I work in a steel plant. You forget about that. Lord, if only I could win this, if only I could do that, if only, if only. If only he's never accomplished anything. If God would have said, if only my son would become a sacrifice for them. No, there was no hesitation whatsoever. I love them and I'm going to die for them. You love the Jerusalem saints, you Corinthians, then supply for them. It's only proper. You say you love your brothers and sisters in Christ and yet you let them starve while you have something. And remember, here Paul is in Macedonia with poorer Christians than the Corinthians. And they gave beyond their ability because there was a need. In a sense, he's reprimanding. And the word perform is an aorist imperative. Perform it once and for all. And even though it's in the imperative com uh, mode as a command, it doesn't violate the fact that they're in an age of grace. You have to do it. You have to act it out, Christians. Perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, there may be a performance also out of that which you have. We will be judged according to what we've possessed. Sometimes I wonder when I think of the Christians that are dying and starving in other countries, let alone in our own country, and the things that I possess, if I will be judged for the excess and for the excess that I spend my money on. I'm all, you know, our human nature is always looking for something better. I know when I see a car that looks better than mine, I say, maybe I should sell mine and get it, but then I'm just furthering myself into debt. You, we have to watch ourselves because a lot of the things we like doing, it's, it's for ourselves, and we don't think of others. Thank the Lord that he was not thinking of himself when he was in heaven, or he would have killed every one of us. But he thought of us, not himself. That's why Jesus Christ became our sacrifice. He says in verse 12, For if there first be a willing mind, it is acceptable according to that which a man hath, and not according to which he has not. And in verse 13 he says, For I mean not that other men be eased and you burdened. And in the next verse he mentions two words, equality. There has to be equality. It's good to supply for others, but then he says, listen, if supplying for others is going to put you in a state where you have to be supplied, then there's a problem. Obviously, God expects us to take care of our own. He knows our families have needs. But what we have to recognize is what is need and what is surplus. I really enjoyed uh, three weeks ago when John Faulkner spoke here on Sunday night. He said, what do we give God? Do we give him our best or do we give him leftovers? And I am personally convicted that I, would, I have been doing that. I mean, sure, I have bills to pay, but you know how bills are. You keep paying them, and well, Lord, there's nothing left for you. He gave me it in the first place. Now, I repeat, this is not a plea for money. Not at all. This is divine instruction from our book. And the divine instruction says, well, as we looked last week, that the apostles didn't come up to the people and try to edge them on and say, listen, you have to, you have to. No. It has to be according to your will. But what Paul is interested in is what I am interested in today is the fact that we can become rich in heaven by abundance of joy and again, deep poverty. I, I just can't get over the Macedonian Christians. None of us today are in that position. All of us have clothes and food and probably too much because most of us are overweight. Or should I speak to myself? But we all have abundance from our Lord and we're to be thankful for it. But there are needs, Christians, that have to be met according to the scriptures. And then again he says, you are supplied. He uses the greatest example too, again, that would be very fitting for a Jewish person in verse 15. As he says, as it is written... He that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. Where does this basis of equality start from? We have an example. Just let me read it to you in the book of Exodus. The manna that was given to the people for their sustenance by our Lord. And in verse uh, 14 he says, 
And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there was a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost, on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, It is manna, for they knew not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. Now, just to make a long story short, he said, You are to gather it, but according to your needs. Whatever you need to survive for the day, take. Take no more than that. Some took less, some took more. And the ones that were trying to hoard it, and when I mean hoard it, they tried to store it all up in case their God forgot them the next day. When they got up the next day, it was nothing but worms. Just gone away. And even when they were told to uh, on Friday, or probably Thursday, to pick double the amount because on the Sabbath you're to rest, even on the Sabbath some people went out and tried to collect and they turned wormy again. In other words, equality was introduced by God. I will take care of your everyday need. He took them across the sea. He took them out of Egypt. And yet, faithless as they were, they kept trying to get more and store it up. How can we compare that to ourselves today? First of all, we have to recognize that the manna was a provision from God. Not from man. God said, I'll supply your every need. And if we look in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, it's the same thing. The grace that we have in verse 1 is bestowed and continually bestowed or given to us by God himself. Number two, the manna back there in the Old Testament was collected and gathered for the need of the people. And here we have this grace, which is given by God, there for a purpose. It was for the needs of the people. It was for the needs of the people. Thirdly, the manna was essential for life. And in a sense, people that are starving do need money and supplies. At this point, Paul wasn't carrying uh, bales of hay and clothes and everything else because he had a long way to go. He was carrying money for the needs of those saints. And just as they didn't want to trust in God and they said, we've got to take more just in case. I don't know. I don't think God's able to supply for me. It turned to worms. The same thing is going to happen, Christian, at the judgment seat of Christ for all that I have hoarded from God. Well, I know they're starving, Lord, but, you know, I've got to have, you know, more money. I've got to keep stashing it away just in case. Now, there's nothing wrong with having an account. Nothing wrong. I'm not saying, well, boy, everybody go clear their bank accounts out. But what about the other individuals? What about the needs of other Christians? What about the need of your ministry? Shall we forget? This is why the cults are just literally expanding beyond compare because of the income they have. Those people have the wrong Lord, but they have the right precepts and principles. And then again, the manna turned to worms, and all that we have that was not used for the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ is going to dissolve. Wood, hay, and stubble. Under fire, perishes. But gold, silver, and precious stones the things that we do willingly for others, for the Lord's work, goes on into eternity. The heavenly bank account. Let's see if we can make that account real fat because it's for the benefit of every one of us in the heavenlies. This world, as Vince was stating before, is going to pass away and all the things therein. He says, you came into the world naked, surely you're going out the same way. But God gives us a chance to make a storehouse of riches in the heavenlies by giving him service. Well, we're out of time. But I encourage you to keep looking at this and probably two Sundays down the road I'd like to try to complete the issue because it's written within the scriptures, it's written for our admonition, and it's written for our conviction. And as Paul says, I'm telling it because of the earnestness of others, the Macedonians, and now I tell it because of the example of Jesus Christ. Unselfish, unprejudiced giving. He gave himself. Let's encourage one another to serve our Lord more and more as the week goes by. And as Vince stated before, count your blessings. When you look at the end of a day, can we actually say, yes, Lord, I'm doing this for you? Or have we lived another day where there's a big X in eternity? Let's have a word of prayer. Again, our Father, we just thank you that you've given us your word and the freedom, Father, which we can enjoy and learn.
and understand, Father, what you expect from Christians. Father, let us be good examples of those that are around us. Let us show them the love that the Lord Jesus Christ showed for us. Let us preach to them, Father. Let us give them the word that's able to convict and to give them life. And then again, Father, we ask you to work even in our wills as you worked in the wills of the Macedonian Christians and the Corinthian Christians. Father, you can work in our minds too, Father, to have our will be suited for yourself, to serve you in newness of mind. And Father, we just thank you that you've given us responsibility as Christians. Let us fulfill our responsibility and let us look heavenward. As your word says, our citizenship is in heaven. Thank you, Father, for this great hope and for the willingness of the sacrifice of your Son to give us and make this hope possible. In his name we praise you, Father. Amen.